May the words of my mouth and meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Here we are, third Sunday of Advent, and if you've noticed outside in the hallway, the Christmas tree is looking very much like it's even closer to Christmas than that. Ten days hence, we will celebrate the Nativity of our Lord, and I'm sure you all are ready and are just kicking back, waiting for it all to happen. <laughs> you notice that we've taken a little bit of a shift and we've moved off our blue candles and lit uh, the third candle for this Sunday of Advent. This is uh, the rose candle. I'm very careful not to call it the pink candle. I did that in the presence of one of my Anglo-Catholic friends one day and I thought I was never gonna hear the end of it. <laughs> This Sunday is variously known throughout the church in more Anglo-Catholic uh, uh, wings of the church as Gaudete Sunday, which means, uh, is Latin for rejoice. And this is also called Stirrup Sunday. Do you know why it's called Stirrup Sunday? Well, look at the colic for today. Stir up your power, O Lord, <laughs> and with great might come among us. So for those of you who do not have everything done in the next 10 days, it's time to get stirred up. <laughs> for those of you who have finished everything, you can gaudete for the next 10 days. Rejoice, <laughs> rejoice, rejoice. To stir, be stirred up and to rejoice simultaneously uh, is for us a call on this, the third Sunday of Advent, as we deal with John the Baptist seeking clarity just about who Jesus is and what his role has been in preparing the way for Jesus. John the Baptist has been placed in prison. Uh, we don't know why and so much in Matthew's Gospel. Luke goes into more detail as to why he's been placed there. Does anybody remember why John is in prison? He's called out the king for having a dalliance with his brother's wife. As we said last week, John did not read Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, sometimes when you speak the truth to power, it's best to do it gently and perhaps in an oblique way, but John was never given to much subtlety. And so he's found himself incarcerated, and yet in the midst of that incarceration, he continues seeking after the truth as it's revealed and he understands its revelation to becoming in the anointed of God, the Messiah. It would be easy for us to say, well, John must have been very clear about what was to happen, but apparently not so much because this story or a version of it occurs in three of the four gospels in Mark, uh, not so much, but in Matthew, Luke, and in John's gospel, we have this conversation going on between John's disciples and Jesus. John has sent his disciples to ask a particular question. And I wonder sometimes if it is not uh, useful for Matthew, for Luke, and for John to put this question in John's mouth because they were a little bit afraid to ask it themselves, a question that you and I might pull back from asking as well. When we encounter this Jesus of Nazareth, we may very well ask ourselves, are you the one who is to come or are, to we, are we to wait for another? Despite all the evidence that we know the rest of the story, what happens through Jesus' death and resurrection, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we might ask that question from time to time. Are you the one to come or are we to wait for another? And to engage our doubts oftentimes is what helps our faith become more tried and true. Doubt is not the opposite of faith as much as I think a lack of trust is the opposite of faith. I spoke on the first Sunday of Advent about the subtle but important difference of coming to the Advent season with a sense of expectancy as opposed to expectation. 
meaning that the expectation we have of a particular thing happen, happening versus something happening. And how we trust in the goodness of that something is the difference between faith and our lack of trust. If we trust God to do God things in our life when he is called upon, when she is called upon, then we are free to let go of outcomes because we know that whatever happens, if God, Emmanuel, is with us, then we need not worry. I think I've shared with you before on the refrigerator door as I was growing up, my mother had posted, worry is the misuse of the imagination. Many of the things that I worry about never come to pass. And it's a failure of imagination on my part, and I think that is primarily a lack of discipleship and perhaps a shortage of prayer. As we engage in these last 10 days of Advent, when we expect the coming of Christ in a new way, a Christ that is coming both as the child in the major and the savior on the cross, we are or should feel free to ask questions about, are you the one to come or should we wait for another? And Jesus has had tendency in my life and the life of congregations, the church writ large to show up when it's most necessary in precisely the right way never too early and never too late, and very seldom according to my plan. As I said before, and as whether you're stirred up to get some things done or you're ready to rest and wait for it to happen, there's nothing we can do in this season of Advent that will cause the coming of Christ any more quickly, nor is there anything that we can do to delay the coming of Christ among us. We are given a clear expectation of what it might look like. And the expectation is not about the fulfillment of ancient prophecy as much as it is about a description of a redemptive present. And that redemptive present for Jesus looks in a very particular way as we see in his response to John's disciples. He says to them, Go and tell John what you see, right? That the lame walk, the deaf hear, the blind have their sight granted to them, the lepers are cleansed, the lame walk, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Jesus will encounter in all the gospels, push back from the religious establishment that says you're not doing it the way I would have you do it. In fact, if we look at the rest of these verses in Matthew's gospel, uh, particular verses 18 and 19, uh, Jesus likens the establishment and the people of his day, uh, the religious establishment as children in the courtyard. So when I played the flute for you, you did not dance. You said that John came and was too serious and that the Son of Man came and he was a glutton or a drunkard. Basically what they're saying is that they have got a particular expectation of what God's presence will look like in their midst, and if it doesn't fit their expectation, they're ready to get rid of it. John didn't eat or drink, and he's not right, and Jesus eats and drinks too much, and he's not right. And we like those people in the religious establishment oftentimes have a difficult time taking yes for an answer. And the yes that we have to take for an answer is, are you the one to come? And the answer is yes. Are we to wait for another? No, but it might be helpful to wait for uh, coming again, for Jesus to be represented to you in a new way. And what does that look like for us as individuals? It comes when we can, with good faith, go back to those who question the relevance or reality of Jesus in the world today, and that we can say with confidence that we have seen 
the lame walk. We have seen the blind receive their sight. We have experienced the opening of the ears of those who cannot or would not hear. We've seen people cleansed of diseases and ailments. And we've seen good news preached to the poor. And that good news has a particular expression as we look around us in this Advent season. As we kicked off on that first Sunday of Advent in the midst of our cast week, we were proclaiming good news to the poor, feeding the hungry, giving shelter to those without. And as Don Babcock pointed out to me, uh, two weeks ago there were 111 tags on that tree out there, and today they've all been filled. This is what the coming of the kingdom looks like. This is what it means for us to be greater in the kingdom of heaven than even John the Baptist. Not that we have it all figured out, but that we are willing to continue to ask questions about where would you have us go, Lord, and what would you have us do? And if we have integrity, if we are honest, we are able to speak with the voice of the prophet Isaiah when he was posed this question. Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here I am, Lord, send me. The question is not who will do for God's people, but perhaps how is it that we will allow God to work through us to ease the burdens of those who carry too much? As we will hear in Matthew's Gospel, down the road, we'll hear the comfortable words that may resonate for some of you who have more of a familiarity with right one. Come to me, all ye that travail and are heavy, under heavy burden, and I will refresh you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. We are called in this season of Advent to a life of repentance that John baptized us into, into a life of discipleship that Jesus calls the Twelve and us by extension into, and to a life of ministry to be present in the midst of the world's deepest need and our greatest passion. May we, as this Advent unfolds, continue to step boldly into the breach and to go where God has called us to go, saying, here we are, Lord, send us. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Will the coming of God be in our midst? The time is now. The laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful. Therefore, let us go in pairs out into the labor, into the vineyard, and to reap the harvest that God has sown for his people. May the kingdom of God come among us in the chaos of these next 10 days. And may we, in the ensuing 12 days, that is the Christmas season, Revel in God's presence and expect to be surprised as we turn toward the epiphany light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.